Today we're going to be looking at a geometry problem. Now what I'd like to do, my plan for this video, is to actually show you three ways to solve the problem. And before I do that, I actually, it just occurred to me only just recently that I've been doing this for a really long time. Actually uh, right now it's November 2022, which means this YouTube channel has actually existed for almost exactly 10 years. And I, it just, it kind of blows my mind that I've been doing this for that long. Uh, I'm really old. And it's not just for as long as I've been recording videos, um, but it's also for as long as I've been a teacher that I've loved um, having different ways to solve a problem. And that's a big thing in mathematics. And uh, the reason why I point out that I've been doing this for 10 years is because I've got evidence of how much I will go at the same problem or the same concept and um, solve it or, or look at it in different ways. And it occurred to me, that even though I actually do this a lot in my work with teachers, for those who aren't aware, uh, a lot of my uh, work is not just teaching classes, it's actually supporting uh, teachers, other educators, to uh, give them what we call professional learning, which is like, how do you become a better teacher? Um, I have been learning through my 15 years of teaching uh, constantly how to improve, and I love helping other teachers improve too, because I know it makes a difference to the students that we teach. And so when I'm delivering professional learning to other teachers, this is a thing that I emphasize quite a bit and it occurred to me that I don't talk about it much here in in these videos so I kind of just wanted to make a brief note before I dive into this problem and that why it is that I love uh, solving problems in multiple ways and in fact why I've, I've come to realize that uh, particularly over the last yeah I guess five to six years um, I've developed I guess a taste um, for a prob the kind of problem that I like to solve it's the sort of thing which I look at and I'm like oh here's a solution and then I think, oh, there's another way to look at this problem that makes it sort of unfold in an easier way. There's a very elegant solution uh, and it's, it's interesting to have a look at that. And actually the more different solutions I can find to a problem I've come to learn about myself, the more uh, interesting and fascinating I find that problem. And I think the reason why I've kind of developed this taste is number one, um, I have learnt it from other people. Uh, I think when I think about you know, what it means to be a great mathematician or a great mathematics educator, it's often exactly that ability to take on a new perspective that takes a problem which used to be very complex and then develops a key insight or shows a parallel or connection that wasn't obvious that makes the problem easy to solve. It's kind of like a oh, if only you do this, it just kind of falls apart and is very straightforward. That's a really satisfying feeling I've come to realize. And so um, what I've, I've sort of developed for myself is um, a, a desire to seek out problems where there are lots of different ways to think about the problem, uh, lots of different ways to solve it. And even though you might say, well, you know, one way is better than another. Um, we kind of call that strategic competence. You think about all the different strategies and you pick the one that's most efficient. This is actually one of the things that I know I struggled with when I was at school. It's part of why I, I, a lot of the exams that I did, I didn't finish. I knew how to solve the problems, but I chose an inefficient path through that problem. And so it took me this long rather than this long. And then I ran out of time to actually complete the exam. So there is uh, that as a priority, you know, often in life we want to do things in a timely fashion. Uh, but also one of the things that I want to give to all of my students, or give is the wrong word, one of the things I want to cultivate in all of my students and help my students themselves grow, which I guess by extension is you, if you're watching this video, is not just strategic competence, but strategic flexibility. And that's the ability to choose between different methods and to um, roll between them sort of quite Comfortably and say, hey, this isn't just a problem you can look at in one way. Um, you want to be able to take another perspective on things. And I guess that is not just powerful in mathematics. That is also just powerful in life. Uh, a lot of trying to function effectively in the world and how to understand other people and, and get along with them is to be able to take on other perspectives, especially those perspectives that are not uh, instinctive or natural to you. So I guess that's one of the things I love about mathematics, that it, it grows and, and stretches my own ability to see from different perspectives, and that's something which is useful all the time, everywhere. So, without further ado, we're gonna have a go at this problem, and what I'm gonna do is show you these three solutions 
in order of, um, I guess in order of number one, efficiency, um, and number two, in order of kind of the way that I would think that you would go about these, like I'm gonna show you the first solution as the classic solution, the, the one that probably the teacher had in mind or the, um, exam task setter or, who, or whoever wrote this question, uh, whatever they had in mind when they set the question, this is what I think. That's the first solution I'm gonna show you. The second solution is kind of, it's kind of cute. Uh, it gets at a different, another very common area of mathematics um, that will align quite nicely with the first solution that I show you. And then the last solution is one that uh, <laughs> I learned it from someone who, themselves said, you know, this is not a, a solution you would ever recommend as kind of like, hey, use this as a technique. It's gonna be really handy in an exam. It's actually very slow and inefficient, but it's clever in its own way. And when we get to that solution, to that method, um, we'll discuss why. So here we go. Let's have a look at this problem, which involves a square that's been divided up. I mean, this question, as I've shown it to you, doesn't even tell you what the question is, but I think you can probably guess. Here is this square. Uh, it's uh, A, C, D, F. Um, it is, its dimensions are one centimeter by one centimeter. And then you have this shaded region in here, uh, B, G, E, H. And the, as you might be able to guess, um, I guess I could do a, a sort of, hey, notice in one question, what do, you, what do you think about this? As you might be able to guess, the question is, what is the area of B, G, E, H? What's the shaded region? So the way I decided to tackle this first was I thought I would redraw my diagram because this is the question that was posed by someone else and it's obviously like a blurry picture. Um, it's actually not a bad diagram to use, but I, I decided I would draw a sort of clearer version. Same thing, same situation, but it just allows me to kind of manipulate it and draw on top of it a little more easily. And the first technique that I'm going to use involves similar triangles. So maybe I should, should write that. Let's uh, let me move this down, give myself a bit more space. So I'm gonna call this method one, similar triangles. Now, before I dive in to the similar triangles, the first question you should have is, how did I even know that there were similar triangles involved? And <laughs> the most obvious answer to that question is, I've done questions like this before, so I recognize it. But more uh, fundamentally, like that's not very helpful, um, how do I dig into the reasoning um, behind how I know there are similar triangles? Um, especially because the area itself that we're trying to determine, like part of what's challenging is, it is, well, it's not a triangle, it's a quadrilateral. But not only is it a quadrilateral, it's a weird quadrilateral. So you can't work out, or you can't easily work out its area just by using a formula, by saying, oh, it's a rectangle, or a parallelogram, or a trapezium, and I have a formula for that, right? So we are gonna to need to think about BGEH in terms of the shapes around it, and that's what makes me recognize that there's, there's these triangles immediately around it. And these triangles here, if for example, uh, let's, let's focus in on say uh, this triangle here, this is A, B, G. If you compare it to the triangle beneath it, triangle E, F, G, you might have like kind of an eye to see that those two are similar, but I can, I can sort of show very quickly why they have to be similar. Um, it's worth pointing out in, in solving this question, which is just saying, hey, what's the area? Just evaluate it. Uh, I'm not going into a long proof about why these are similar, so I'm not gonna lay that out because this is not a, it's not a deductive geometry proof. It's just a, an, an area measurement. However, I do wanna show why it's actually true that they're um, similar triangles because I'm gonna rely on that fact. The first thing I notice is if I'm looking for similar triangles, um, far and away the easiest to pr way to prove that two triangles are similar is to look at their angles because so long as you have angles that are the same, um, you're going to have a similar pair of similar triangles. There are other ways, but this is the easiest way. You can see, for instance, angle AGB and angle EGF, they're vertically opposite, so they have to be equal. And then when you look at the top and the bottom, say for example, uh, uh, an angle like ABG, compared to an angle like EFG, those are going to be alternate angles on parallel lines because AB and EF, these, this sort of top line, um, edge here and this one down the bottom, they're gonna be parallel because of this square that you got handed from the beginning, right? So since I know that this is parallel to this, that gives me the alternate angles. Um, and I mean, you could use the same uh, proof to, to sort of look at the other ones, but once you've got two angles or two pairs of angles being equal in triangles, the third one has to be equal. So therefore, um, two angles is, or two pairs of angles is sufficient. I can say, bam, they're equal angular, and therefore these are 
um, similar triangles. Now what can I do with these similar triangles? Let me get rid of these markings because I'm going to use this space in a second. I know that the corresponding sides in similar triangles are going to be in proportion or in the same ratio. Uh, and so for example, the ratio from uh, AB to EF, whatever that ratio happens to be, would match the ratio um, from say EG to AG. Those two sides are also the corresponding sides there. Um, now, I could do that, however, like what I want to do is work out the area of um, some of these, these figures here. Like say for example, if you look at, uh, what did I say, start it off, B, G, E, H, right? You can see that this blue area, it sits inside a larger triangle, D, B, F. And so what I really need to do is subtract away this green triangle here, and then I guess I'd have to deal with this triangle over here on the right hand side in a very similar fashion. So if I can work out this area here, I'm good, I'm done, right? And to work out its area, um, the most simple way, I mean I've got a few different tricks up my sleeve for it, but given the information that I have here, I've got the base already, I just need the height, right? If I've got that, then half base height, that gives me the area of EFG, and I'm good to go. I'll repeat the same kind of reasoning over here with D, E, H. So therefore, instead of saying the corresponding sides in similar triangles are in proportion, uh, because I want the height, the height of a triangle is not always uh, a side in the triangle. In fact, it's only a side in the triangle when you've got a right angle triangle. So what I really want is this perpendicular height here, which is not a side, in the triangle, um, but it is a length in the triangle that still corresponds in the same way that the sides correspond and uh, therefore they are in the same ratio. So I guess the path I'm taking is I can determine fairly easily this ratio AB to this ratio EF and that means I can make a comparison between the heights of these uh, two similar triangles. All I need to do is to give them names uh, and then I can actually do the calculation to um, determine the relationship between them and then off I go, okay? So what I'm gonna do is given that this triangle down here uh, in the bottom left, EFG, uh, this is the one that I want the height of. I'm gonna call that X. And even though I could denote the other um, height over here, the corresponding height in the other cylinder triangle, I could de denote it with another letter. Um, I don't need to. I've got enough information in this question to denote it using the same letter um, and its relationship with that letter. Because this vertical height is just going to be equal to 1, therefore I can call this height here, rather than giving it another pronoun rule, I can call it 1 take away x. And that's going to give me the relationship between these two, okay? So my reasoning, if I needed to write it, would be uh, corresponding lengths in similar triangles are in proportion. And then I would launch into saying, well, okay, uh, I'm going to say x over 1 take away x. So the smaller height divided by the larger height is going to be equal to the smaller base, which in this case is a quarter, divided by the larger base, which in this case is a half. So I'm just going to put brackets around those fractions because I've got fractions on fractions, I want to be careful. So that gives me um, something which is pretty easy to deal with. What I'll do is on the right hand side, just so that I don't have um, such messy numbers to deal with, I'll multiply the numerator and the denominator by four. So that gives me on the top a one and on the bottom a two. So that gives me x over one take away x on the left hand side. Now I'm going to cross multiply. So that gives me um, two x on the left, one take away x on the right. I'll add x to both sides. There's still a one uh, over there. So sorry, adding one x is already two x. That gives me three x. So that gives me x equals a third. So now I know the height of that triangle, I already know the base as you can see over here, and so I'm good to go, right? Over on the right hand side, uh, I'm going to rehearse this argument and I'm going to say, well, I've got a height here that I'm interested in, I guess we'll call that y. I've got a different height here, so we'll call that one take away y. And then I can say, well, let's use the same reasoning, but I've got a different pair of, uh, or set of lengths, right? So I'm going to go y over one take away y is going to be equal to, well in this case I've got three quarters as the, uh, the, the base that corresponds to, the base that corresponds to this height, and then I've got a half over here. I'll do the same thing, multiply by four to get rid of those um, denominators there, so y on one take away y, I'm going to get three on the numerator, and then I'm going to get two on the denominator just like I got before. 
Now I'll do my cross multiplication. So 2y equals 3, take away 3y, add 3y to both sides. And so now I've got a height, okay? Happy times. So at this point, I'm pretty much ready to go. The actual area that I want, the area is, uh, what do we call it? B, G, E, H. What it's equal to is this larger triangle, which is, uh, I think we said it was B, D, F. So area triangle BDF, and then what I'm gonna subtract is these two other areas um, that I, I'm gonna get from those triangles, right? Which is the area of this green triangle here is EFG. And then the triangle which I was dealing with on the right hand side, let's label that, it's area, let's see here, DEH, DEH like so. All right, so BDF, it has a base of one, it has a height of one, so therefore its area is going to be a half. And then when I'm doing these calculations here, I'll do a half times the base times the height that I worked out. Then I'm going to do the same process over here, a half times this base times this new height that I worked out, three fifths. Okay, I'm almost there. Just need to tidy up these fractions. So I've got um, 1 over 2 times 4 times 3. Last I checked, that was 24. And then this purple triangle, what have I got on the numerator? That's a 9. And then on the denominator, that's uh, 2 times 20, which is 40. And if you go ahead and you calculate this, uh, you can double check. You should get 7 over 30. So this is units squared if I wanted to actually put the right thing there because I, well actually no, it's not unit squared, it's actually square centimeters, that's handy. Let's put that in there. Bit cheeky of me to add the units in there at the end without writing them all the way along through, but I think you get the right idea. So there you go, that's the area that I'm after. And just doing a quick sense check, right? We know that the whole area here is uh, one by one, so it's a square centimeter, is this whole shape that I'm dealing with. Um, seven over 30, that is roughly, that's very close to seven over 28, so it's, that's a quarter. So this is a little bit less than a quarter, and you eyeball that and you're like, yeah, that looks about half of half of the, uh, of the shape there, of the square. So I'm pretty content that this is the correct answer. And of course, you can go back through all of our different operations and equations to check the logic that we use there.